Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, where we believe there is a produce mom in all of us. I'm Lori Taylor, founder and CEO of the Produce Moms. For 10 years, I sold fresh produce to over 300 grocery stores in the U.S. And today, my team and I are fully focused on inspiring people to eat more fruits and vegetables. This show is just one of the ways that we hope to inspire you and your family to eat more produce and live a better life. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, join our community of almost 40,000 in all 50 states and over 30 countries by visiting theproducemoms.com slash subscribe. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for being here. Enjoy today's show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is the Produce Moms podcast, and I'm Lori Taylor. I love hosting this show because I love being I love being able to invite the best people I know to be part of it. So today we are welcoming Brian Antle. Brian is the executive vice president of sales for Tanamar and Antle. This is a true legacy style company and farming brand in American agriculture. A little bit of quick backstory here. Brian was actually, he was the one who gave me my first tour of Salinas Valley. So the first time I ever saw real agriculture and real, you know, like just produce at the scale that is literally in the backyard of so many of these companies and people like Brian, I I was blown away and I will never forget that day. We have an incredible uh, video on the Produce Moms YouTube channel that I took that day in the field. And it's a, it's a beautiful video and it includes Brian explaining to me, uh, you know, what was happening during the harvest crew and really complimenting the harvest crew as just saying, you know, this is, this is absolutely a skilled labor. And, you know, we really dove into his gratitude for, for those employees and, and his teammates at Tanamar and Antle. Um, Brian also, I mean, no one races a Baja truck like Brian. And I must say, I had the, I had the shotgun seat for that in Yuma, but, uh, yes, Brian, I am so glad you're here. This is long overdue. Welcome to the produce moms podcast, my friend. And, uh, you are a true leader and icon in our industry. And I feel very blessed to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you, Lori. It's good to be with you. And uh, yeah, you made me laugh thinking about those couple times, uh, especially the time we raced the truck together. That was pretty fun. But yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for being here, Brian. So please tell us a little bit, tell our audience a little bit about your professional background and uh, introduce us to Tanamar and Antle. Yeah, I mean, my professional background, I mean, when I say I was born into it, I truly was born into the business uh, as a family member of you know, one of the two families that manages and owns Tanner and Antle. I was born into it on day one. Um, you know, my mom's side of the family is also a large produce shipper who we actually one of our biggest competitors. So uh, it's kind of funny. You know, both sides of my family are very big in the produce world and we compete against each other every day. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how I was truly born into it. I mean, uh, my professional career, if you call it a start of a professional career at a young age, I started uh, working on the farm when I was 14 years old. Uh, you know, I, I always joke I had a a year I didn't do so good in school, so my dad made me go out and move sprinkler pipes on the ranch that summer. Which, you know, if you've never moved sprinkler pipes, it's a very long and hard day of work, and it's seven days a week, 12 plus hours a day. And moving the sprinkler pipes is how we get all the crops irrigated. So it's a vital part of what we do and kind of kind of the level where everybody starts out when you're a kid growing up. So I went out to move sprinkler pipes as uh, as punishment, but turned out I was surprised <laughs> at the end of the week when I got a paycheck and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. I didn't think I was going to get paid. So, right. you know, once I got paid, I, I kept staying out there. And uh, ever since then, you know, if I wasn't, in school or if I wasn't uh had any other activities I was always out on the ranch working through the the different aspects of our business and I've truly I've, I've I always joked that I've worked in every department except our sales department and that was probably for a good reason and now here I am running our sales department so I was just gonna uh, yeah, say you told me I, your team work. told me that's your new title now Brian <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we made some changes recently, and I came in to run our sales department. And like I said, I always joke that was a job I would never take, but uh, here we are. And yeah, it's been a good, uh, a good journey and a good time to to get where I'm at now, and uh, having a lot of fun doing it. 
Yeah. Well, you, you truly, I think you were born for sales. Uh, you, you have a lot of those beautiful attributes that your dad had, who is a true legend. We miss him in the industry. I know as someone who misses my dad in my personal life, I know that you identify with that sentiment as well. Um, and, but I do want, I, I think you're being a little humble here, Brian, about, uh, answering the question, who is Tana Marinantle? Um, for those that are listening, this is the company that that really changed the the access the rest of the United States had to f- to fresh leafy greens. Um, I, I remember from that from that day in Salinas Valley. I, I forget which member of the Tanamura family was explaining it to me, Brian, but they said we were the first company that put iceberg lettuce on a rail car on on ice and shipped it from California to New York city and it arrived fresh. And from there, as they say, the rest is history, but Brian, tell us, you know, how do you describe when people ask you who don't know about fresh produce, how do you describe Tanamara and Antle? Yeah, I think the story of Tanamara and Antle goes back, uh, you know, prior to Tanamara and Antle. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. Tanamara and Antle is a relatively young company. It was founded in 1982, but the partnership between the two families goes back much further than that. And, you know, to the days of my great grandfather, Bud Antle, um, you know, Bud and his parents, they immigrated out from Oklahoma during the, uh, during the Dust Bowl, escaping the droughts and ended up here in California. The Tanamura family in the thirties immigrated from Japan and, and also ended up here in California, just about 40 miles North of where we're at today in Salinas. And uh, at the time, the two families didn't know each other. Uh, the the Tanamuras were set up. They were uh, small farmers in Aromas, California, just outside of Watsonville. And they were growing vegetables for market. And uh, my family, uh, Bud Annell, <clears throat> excuse me, my great-grandfather, he was working in the packing sheds at the time. And uh, that was in the old days of where you cut the lettuce and vegetables in the field. They were brought into a packing shed that were then packed into the wooden crates and shipped out, uh, shipped out to consumers that way. They carried on like that for many years. Um, And then, uh, you know, when World War II came around with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you know, the the Tanamura family was actually put into the internment camps down in Arizona. Um, Two of the brothers actually enlisted and fought for the U.S. during the war effort and, uh, and the rest of the family. Uh, Thirteen siblings, mother and father, were all interned down in, uh, down in Arizona, as I said. And they were down there for five years. When they got out, uh, you know, they came back here to the Salinas area, started over. Uh, you know, at the time, there was a large resentment towards the Japanese and they were having a pretty tough go of it, trying to get, you know, land and equipment, you know, growing deals put together, <clears throat> you know, at roughly the same time, uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather, Bud, he decided he was going to start his own packing house at the time. And he called it Bud of California. And, uh, and he was having a pretty tough go of it too, because, you know, he was a, a new packing facility and uh you know a lot of the growers had deals with other more well-established packing facilities and a lot of people didn't want to grow for him um that's really how the the tanner and animal families came about through uh Mm -hmm. you know separate problems and a mutual solution right i think they got together and my great-grandfather bud said hey listen you guys are fantastic growers that's proven um, you know, I have no problem with you being Japanese, so why don't you guys grow the crops? I'll market it for you under my label, Bud of California, and we mm-hmm. both win, right? You get a packing house, or you have somebody to market and pack the produce, and I get somebody that can uh, grow for me and provide the product I need to market. So that's really how the two families came together. That was right after the war, uh, World War II, and, and that really flourished as a relationship and that mm-hmm. company bud of california grew to be a global company you know he had the packing houses here on the west coast we had sales offices on the east coast there was a couple international sales offices overseas uh, where we were shipping overseas and you know this was all ahead of my time this was in the in the 60s and 70s when all this was booming 
Um, and then when Bud passed away in the uh, in the seventies, the company was sold to Castle and Cook, which was then sold and became Dole Fresh Vegetables. So mm-hmm. uh, my family and the Tanamuras went to work for Castle and Cook at the time, and and uh, they worked there for a handful of years before everyone kind of decided that you know they didn't want to work for anybody and they'd rather work for themselves again and. In 1982, the the two families came together and said, you know, hey, if we all if we were all to leave together and go put a growing deal together, you guys want to partner up? And, you know, kind of the the agreement was that Tanamaras with their expertise in farming and land management, that they would do all the farming and the Antles with the marketing and sales expertise, we would do the marketing and sales side of it. So that's really how TNA started in 1982. I mean, I always joke yeah. that the original plan was, you know, we were going to pack 100,000 cases of produce a week and be this, you know, small family farm. And, uh, you know, somewhere along the way, that plan got lost. And, you know, today we ship probably 140,000 boxes a day. Uh, you know, we're growing 40,000 acres between California and Arizona and you know it works out to 30 40 million cases a year of lettuce romaine broccoli cauliflower specialty lettuces onions celery really the whole gamut of what you would find at the grocery store is what we now uh, what we now market and grow and I mean, size wise we're probably one of the largest growers of shippers of vegetables on in the US and likely the world so that's that's kind of the short story of how you know two small families in California came together and created this large company. Now, mm, well, it's a beautiful story, and I will say, as you were talking, I couldn't help but smile, Brian, when you were saying that the Antel family was handling the sales and the marketing, and here you are today, Brian Antel, <laughs> as the EVP of sales. You're exactly where you were meant to be. So. <laughs> But I, I, I never <laughs> doubted my sales and marketing skills. It's my patience that I've always said wasn't well, good for sales. You, that's, you know, <laughs> you surround yourself with but patient and good people. Work. Yes. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned you mentioned this incredible assortment and vast array of what y'all grow. I know from having the pleasure of working with Tanamer and Antle at the Produce Moms, t- TNA has about four product lines. So can we can we talk through those product lines now? Can I put you in the sales hot seat, Brian? Yeah, I mean, what we call our core commodities are those ones I just touched on, right? I mean, it's the lettuce. Romaine, specialty lettuces, cauliflower, broccoli, um, onions, celery. That's kind of what we consider our core commodities. Um, Outside of that, we have our artisan branded line of products. And those are products that have been uniquely bred for different taste profiles, um, colors, qualities, crunchability, if you will. Um, We have an artisan lettuce which you'll find in a clamshell. It's, you know, two red, two green, small petite lettuce heads packed together that makes a really nice presentation when all blended together into a salad. We have our artisan onion, which is a flat Italian sweet red onion. Um, Again, it's a proprietary to us. It's a very mild onion. It doesn't make you cry when you cut it. It doesn't make your mouth explode when you bite into it. Um, we have an artisan romaine, which is a, a fully grown miniature romaine head that's very sweet, um, compact in size, lots of leaf, lots of usable, um, lots of usable leaves. And that makes up our artisan program. Yeah. We then have uh, a hydroponic line of products. So we have a hydroponic facility out in Tennessee where we grow vegetables under glass floating on water and we have a variety of leaf items that we grow out there and uh, market and sell under the Tanimer and Antle brand but grown hydroponically and then finally we have an organic line of products so some of our core commodities we also grow organically uh, so that would be we have romaines um, broccoli cauliflower, celery, 
romaine, uh, and those items grown organically for the uh, for the consumer demand of organics. Right, right. So pretty much everything, right? <laughs> this is what you're saying, but no, well, it's, a, it's amazing. We grow Brian, a lot. You do grow a lot. How have I never been to the farm in Tennessee? I mean, I think it's got to be four or five hours driving distance from my home. I need to come. Yeah, I mean, probably because you've never asked or never shown up, but we'd love to have you. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know, it's a short drive south in Nashville. All so, right, all yeah, right. We'd love to have you come out. Sounds good. All right, we're putting it on the calendar. Well, Brian, I know from our from our pre show conversations and from the work again that we've done with your brand, your vision entails operating as a highly innovative and sustainable company growing and enhancing the lives of all through the, from the employee ownership and customer inspired partnerships. And so I kind of want to talk more about that right now, like the ethos of, you know, the let's dive into the culture of Tanamar and Antle. I mean, my goodness, what an incredible heritage that this brand has. And you got a, you got a big responsibility to keep that going now. Um, but let's talk first about innovation because you mentioned in your remarks about, you know, the, the, the flavor profiles and some of these other, you know, very positive characteristics that it's one of those things like, it's the thing that, you know, for all of our listeners, it's like the thing you didn't know you needed that you need, like an onion that doesn't make you cry and a red onion that tastes a little sweet, not spicy. You know, those are things that you need, but you didn't really know you needed it until maybe someone like Brian Antle is telling you that. But let's let's talk about how Tanner and Antle is committed to innovation because you you are pioneers in this space. You're, you're leaders, you're, you're trailblazers. Yeah, I thank you for that. I mean, uh, I feel our company has always been very rooted in innovation, right? I mean, when you think back to the Bud of California days, I mean, you know, there are there's techniques that we use that are the global standard in produce now that were born through that company. I mean, you know, Bud Animal was the first to pack uh, lettuce in, you know, in cellophane and to wrap a head of lettuce. We were the first to use cardboard boxes. Um, you know, the invention or not invention, but the implementation of vacuum cooling, um, to cool the produce prior to shipping is what led us led to the ability to get away from the rail cars and having to ice everything. Um, so, you know, really by using the cellophane, the cardboard box and vacuum cooling, which we pioneered many years back in the sixties, um, you know, that opened the door to being able to ship by truck and ship around the world. And then from there, I mean, you know, the list of things we've innovated along the way is it's a long and boring list for people that don't work in the industry every day, but you know, a lot of what we've done in the fields and our growing techniques, you know, the harvest machines we've built, the harvest techniques we've developed, um, you know, the post, handling at the coolers and the shipping, you know, there's been a lot of innovation um, in just the day-to-day -day work that we do to become more efficient and provide better quality to the customers. But then in the background, you know, there's, you look at innovation in many different ways, right? I mean, everything I just talked about is kind of innovation on the equipment side or, you know, the process side, but when you start talking about innovation on the product lines, you know, our artisan line of products, the artisan onion, um, you know, some of the different lettuces we grow, you know, we have a seed company uh, called three star lettuce seed where we breed our own genetics, right? So we can take a head of lettuce and we can breed it to be a certain color, a certain size, a certain taste. Uh, you know, that's not done through GMOs. It's all just done through natural mm -hmm. breeding that takes years and years of breeding. Um, you know, so next week, actually, we'll be down in Yuma, Arizona for our big trial. So, you know, Three Star Lettuce Seed next week has probably a couple thousand different seed varieties all planted out in the same field. And we're going to spend the week going through there, picking out what colors we like, what size we like, what tastes we like, and then breeding those plants together over the next years to hope to make a better product. And then we do the same thing, breeding that seed to be, uh, you know, resistant to certain diseases in the field and mildew pressures that we get. So there's a lot of innovation that goes on on that side. 
um, you know, to create different vegetables, which, you know, at times it sounds weird to think we're creating new vegetables. It's not really a new vegetable, but a different way of presenting that same vegetable, right? When you look at uh, our artisan romaine, it's, you know, you take a romaine heart and you make it better by making it smaller, more compact, more usable leaves, and in my opinion, better tasting. Mm -hmm. uh, and all that is done through, you know, innovation with genetics. <clears throat> and then the third way I look at the innovation is our diversified businesses. So, you know, Tanner and Anil is the umbrella company, but under that umbrella, we have a group of diversified businesses. You know, one of those being Three Star Seed that I just spoke of. Um, another one is called Plant Tape. Uh, plant tape is an I, automated. Brian, I have to ask you: Do you remember who wrote on the yeah. plant tape machine that on that glorious trip to <laughs> Salinas? You did. It was the I best know. field that was ever planted. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. I think I need a T-shirt, Brian. I was there the first time plant tape uh, did a did its first pass in Salinas. I was on the plant tape. You know, I was on the tractor that had the plant tape machinery hookup. <laughs> well, yeah, you were part of history because right. that. I mean, that has now become, you know, a, a global business. I mean, it's in over a it's dozen countries around the world. We're using that technology. And, you know, as you know, that technology automates the action of growing plants in a nursery and then transplanting them into the field. You know, traditionally that was all done by hand. Now we've developed uh, equipment that does that mechanically. So mm -hmm. we have plant tape doing that and uh, we just, invested into another new company called Stout Ag Innovation. Uh, and that company is based around uh, what we're calling smart farm equipment, right? I mean, to this point, most farm equipment is pretty basic, does the job, moves the dirt, piles it up how you need it to do. But now we're trying to build machines that can intelligently do the jobs uh, that were primarily done um, by people, right? So right. the first machine they've built is a weeder. So the machine is using artificial intelligence and computer vision systems to eliminate weeds in the field mechanically versus having to send people through the fields to pick them out by hand or using a hoe. So uh, we're really excited about that company and, uh, and all that is now capable with the technology we have, right? Through artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, we're able to couple that now with uh, some of the mechanical aspects of what we do in the farm. And uh, hopefully the next time you're out here, we'll get to show you some of those machines because it's what they're yes. doing at Stout is just truly mind blowing. Five yeah. years ago, I would have never thought we'd be doing what we're doing. And now uh, it's super exciting to think what they're going to be doing five years from now. So really cool right. technology. No, I can't wait to see it. So let's let's talk about this for a minute, if if you don't mind, because, you know, all this innovation that is rooted in, you know, robotics and technology and mechanization on the farm that is, you know, essentially, you know, it's, it's eliminating labor positions. Right. I mean, but let's let's talk about that and help people understand how that's not a bad thing. Like farmers have been facing a labor crisis I, I mean, I feel like it's been perpetual labor crisis, but I mean, for sure, for the last two decades that I've been part of this industry, labor has been the, the num like one of the top critical barriers, but um, help people understand how this is actually, this is progress for, for, for your, your labor teammates. Yeah, certainly we are no stranger to labor shortages uh, as an industry. I mean, it's mm -hmm. with everything going on right now, it's kind of, it's kind of funny watching other industries complaining about labor issues they're currently facing. Cause it's the first time they've ever had to face them. I mean, if uh, anyone involved in agriculture on our side of the industry, I mean, we've been struggling with labor issues for 20 to 30 years, you know, caused by various different elements, but yeah, I mean, now we have a lot of machinery and technology that's coming. You know, I'm always cautious to say we're eliminating jobs because although it looks like, you know, at face value, we're eliminating jobs. I mean, really what we're doing is replacing jobs that nobody wants to do anymore. Right. Bingo. I mean, you know, especially yes. when you look at what's 
scouts doing with their leader. I mean, that one machine replaces, you know, probably 20 people walking through the field with a hoe picking weeds out of the fields. You know, if the people were available to do that work, maybe we wouldn't be going down that path, but just there's nobody knocking on our door that wants to go hoe weeds all day. Right. It's not Mm -hmm. a glorious or fun job. And um, so again, I, I'm cautious when I say we're eliminating jobs because, you know, the machines and techniques we're creating aren't putting people on the street. I mean, they're just, they're filling voids where we no longer have labor. Um, and, and it's, it's tough, but, but we have to keep advancing because we don't know, you know, we can't sit around holding our breath, hoping the labor is going to get better. You know, history shows the labor is not going to get better and, and, you know, I don't want to turn it into a political argument, but there's you know, lots of reasons people think it's happening. Um, but it's just, you know, the labor pool for what we do is drying up. You know, we have an aging mm-hmm. workforce and, uh, you know, there's not not a good way to replenish the workforce reliably outside of guest worker programs, which we do use. The H2A program um, is used, you know, industry wide and and it's helpful to us. It gets us through it, but it, you know, it's, it's not the easiest system to use and it's not the, certainly not the cheapest. It's very costly to use H2A labor. So anywhere right. we can automate and, uh, and a lot of the things we build aren't eliminating a job. It's making somebody's job easier, right? Like, you know, you yes. rode on the plant tape machine, you know, the person up top working the plant tape machine, you know, traditionally that person would be, pulling thousands of tr- plants out of a tray all day and dropping them into the dirt, right? We've taken that same person and coupled them with some automation to make their job easier. So mm-hmm. that person doesn't get eliminated. Their job becomes more efficient. And now that one person with the same output can do the work of, you know, three to five people. So right. Right. It's, uh, it's how we work more efficiently with what we have. You're right. And I thank you for sharing that. I know that, but it's a question we get often, you know, at the produce moms and I appreciate the way you so eloquently explained it. Um, you know, as you were talking, it's like, Hey, (laughs) it's a great opportunity for me to remind my listeners another line. You're probably sick of me saying on this show, but I'm going to say it again. Food security is the ultimate national security. I mean, these farmers, you know, companies like Tanamar and Antel working towards these solutions um, in the name of sustainability, innovation, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, they are taking the necessary steps to make sure that households like yours and mine has food accessible, available and, you know, a, uh, affordable, even even despite the rising costs of all industry goods, we are still able to provide the most nutrient dense food to folks at dollar for dollar, you know, penny for penny, ounce for ounce, at a more affordable rate than almost any other food item or commodity that is sold in the in the entire grocery store. So. With all of that, I'm very thankful for your work and commitment to this innovation, Brian. Um, I stand firm behind my previous sentiments that Tana Marinantel is an absolute leader in this process. So anything that you'd like to share about additional sustainability practices, I really want to get into uh, you know, your, your employee shared ownership program so that people can understand that about your corporate culture, but um, certainly anything else that you'd like to talk about from a sustainability point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our jokes always, you know, farmers, you know, we're the inventors of sustainability. I mean, without mm-hmm. sustaining the dirt, there's no livelihood for what we do. So, you know, a lot of times agriculture and especially big agriculture, you know, we get a bad rap or we're always in the spotlight of, you know, uh, trying to skirt rules and do different things. But I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the ground is the most valuable asset we have next to our employees. You know, without either one, uh, there is no sustainability. So, you know, sustainability of the farmland is, you know, top of mind to us, you know, and that's every year. You know, we look at our whole land base and, you know, we have to go out and take soil samples. You know, what nutrients do we need to add to the ground? What, what ground needs to take a break, you know, and when we say take a break, you know, not plant a crop on it. Uh, you know, as you would imagine, when we don't plant a crop on it, we're not making money on it, but 
we know that there's years where we have to just let the ground rest and take a break and plant a cover crop onto it. So we have to take that into account, you know, our crop rotation, you know, you can't plant lettuce every year on the same piece of ground, right? And lettuce pulls out different nutrients and introduces different diseases than other crops will. So we have to be constantly rotating our crops between, you know, lettuce and the next crop be broccoli and then a celery, then back to lettuce. So, um, you know, we have a whole team that manages, you know, what you would call our sustainability program of our planting schedule. Um, and then on, you know, the crop management side, I mean, we have our own in-house PCAs, we call it pest control advisors who, you know, they're out walking the fields, looking to see what the plants need, you know, if there's any bugs or disease, I mean, you know, Anytime we have to go out and treat the field with any sort of, you know, chemical spray, fertilizer, I mean, it costs us money to do that and eats into the profit. So, you know, the yes. less is better for us. So it's a very balanced approach of, you know, what the crop needs, what the land needs, and, and ultimately, you know, the bottom line of needing to make money on the crop also. Um, mm -hmm. So we look at sustainability in a lot of different ways. And then, you know, you spoke to about our employees. I mean, truly, the employee base is our sustainability. I mean, you've mm -hmm. been out to the field. You've seen what we do. We cannot do what we do without everybody showing up to work every day. Right? There mm -hmm. would be a, you know, normally when I look out my window here, I see harvest crews, but I'm in Salinas. And right now, we're, all the harvest is in Yuma. But you know, today, while you and I are having this conversation, there's 2,500 people down in Arizona cutting vegetables to be shipped out tonight. And where will those vegetables go? Let's, I mean, it's help people understand the footprint of where, you know, this hard work that's happening today in Yuma, where will it end up? Yeah, so different times of the year goes different places. But I mean, primarily, all of North America is our market, right? Mm -hmm. So United States, Canada, um, you know, we have a big presence on the East Coast, um, but we service all of your major box stores and retailers all across America and Canada. Um, you know, during times of the year, we uh, will cut our plantings back because some of those areas are, you know, getting what we call their local programs, right? So, during certain times of the year, there's production coming out of Canada, the Northeast, the Southeast, where some of our customers will switch to a local program. Um, but because we move between California and Arizona, you know, we have year round growing. So year round North America, primary market. Um, and then we do ship overseas. I mean, we ship to the UK, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, Hong Kong. I mean, so we have a global footprint. I mean, it's a small amount of what we do internationally, but um, yeah, the majority of it is all your major box stores and retailers here in mm -hmm. the, in North America. Yeah. And it is, I mean, the, I want to remind everyone, if you please go check out that YouTube video, we'll link it in the show notes of, uh, you know, Brian explaining to me what's happening on the farm um, in Salinas. I know you call it a ranch. Sorry, Brian, still after all these years, I call it a farm, um, but it's- uh, I call it everything, farm, okay. ranch, dirt. We all call right, it everything. good, all right. But let's talk a little bit more about, about, let's focus in on the employees because I think that you really inspired so many people in the agriculture industry when and two events took place. One was shared ownership with your employees and two was the Spreckles Crossing housing, employee housing. So I'd love for you to talk about those two things. Yeah. So our employees, I mean, as I said, when you, when you think sustainability, when you think, um, you know, things that are vital to our operation, again, without the employees, this is nothing, right? There's no need for me to be sitting here in a sales desk because there'd be nothing to sell if there weren't people harvesting the crop and, you know, go a step beyond that. I mean, there's no reason to be harvesting the crop, if there's not a guy driving a tractor, putting seeds in the ground and, you know, going all the way back to where I started. If the guy's not moving the sprinkler pipes, putting water on those seeds, none of it works. Right. So really, I mean, nobody is more important than the next person in what we do. It's all a chain of events that leads from, 
you know, the seed going in the ground to a salad getting on somebody's table at night. And, you know, I was lucky. I mean, I, growing up in the business with, you know, as I said, both sides of my family in it, I was taught from a young age how important the employees are. And, and I got to watch firsthand how, you know, my parents and grandparents treated the employees and what was expected of how to treat your employees. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I think I take great pride in how we treat our employees, right? I mean, everyone has the same benefit package, you know, that I have as an owner, you know, down the line to the guy putting a seed in the ground has the same package I have. Uh, we, you know, we try to lead the industry with our, with wages to attract labor. Um, and then, yeah, the two main points you hit on, right, is um, our ESOP and the Spreckles Crossing. Uh, I think Spreckles Crossing was first. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was uh, an employee housing project we built on on our property uh, here at our facilities. Um, you know, for those who aren't familiar with the local area here, I mean, you know, our headquarters is in the middle of Central California on the coast. So price of living here is extremely high. Um, and we found we were losing a lot of labor to the cost of housing here in our area. And just many people could no longer afford housing or the housing that they could afford was not what they would want to live in. Um, And we were beginning to lose people and in turn, you know, lose productivity. We weren't able to harvest our crops on time. Um, So we were actually, you know, walking away from perfectly good crops that we couldn't harvest because we didn't have the people to harvest them. And, you know, when that happened, um, at the time I was running our harvest department and, you know, we had to call a family meeting one day and just say, Hey, you know, something's got to change because we're walking away from crops. We need to be harvesting. And, and it was that day we decided in that meeting, we said, Hey, you know what, we need to build housing for our employees and, Mm -hmm. you know, not just housing, right? We're not going to go build army barracks in the back of our property. We're going to go build a proper, beautiful apartment, complex that our employees can uh, have safe affordable living and call home yeah very proud of them so that was the uh that was the beginning of spreckles crossing um it was uh, a project we had to get done quickly we got it done in a year so uh, the following year when we came back to salinas for harvest i think we moved a a little over 500 people into that apartment complex um so we ended up building a hundred uh, two bedroom, two bath apartments uh, at maximum capacity. We could put 800 people uh, in those apartments. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, usually we have five to 600 employees staying there during a season. And, and we have the rent set. At, I mean, basically the rent pays to cover the electricity bills, right? I mean, right. you know, for your rent, you get your housing, all the utilities, electrical, water, TV, internet, um, that's all included. You know, there's a, some social settings, some game rooms, uh, internet areas where people can go. It has a store on site, laundromats, barbecue area. So, yeah, it's something we're very proud of. Um, you know, anytime somebody imitates what you've done, it's always flattering. And, uh, you know, now there's many, not many, there's a handful of projects that are similar to ours that other companies have done here in, uh, you know, our competitors have built for the same reasons here in Salinas. So, uh, you know, it's something I'm proud of as a company that we did for our employees. And I'm also very proud that it inspired others in our industry to, uh, to build similar settings for their employees also. So I think, uh, not only did it help our employees, it just it helped the it, it better good of all bar. employees in our industry. It raised yeah, the bar. It raised the bar. Yeah, then another aspect of you know innovation and sustainability is our ESOP program, which is our employee stock ownership program. Uh, we started this a handful of years ago when we sold a portion of our business to our employees uh, at no cost to them, right? It, uh, they earn shares in our business through their hard work and dedication, right? So there's uh, certain aspects to qualify for it. You have to work a set number of hours in a year, which most people do. 
Um, and again, through your hard work, your dedication, we make a yearly distribution of shares to our owners and uh, those shares vest over time. And as the value of the business grows, so does the value of their shares. And, and what we've done is we've created a, a retirement program for our employees, right? If, if for whatever reason you depart from Tanimar and Anil, whether through retirement, through, you know, uh, death, firing, laid off, whatever it might be, uh, you can collect your shares and cash in your shares at that time. So it's become a really great program for us. It gives us, you know, another recruitment tool and, uh, and provides our employees with, you know, a retirement benefit that is free to them, right? I mean, unlike a 401k where you're paying into it, um, you know, truly your payment into this is, your hard work, your dedication, your commitment to work at TNA year over year uh, earns you more shares in the business. So it's something we're really excited about and truly think we're very innovative in that aspect too. There's not many companies I know of on the farming side that are doing anything like that. No. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing, right, Brian. That's it's amazing. It. <laughs> All right, Brian. Well, we are closing in on the end of our episode. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on as our guest. I have been smiling so much listening to this. It was, it's just been a, it's been a wonderful tribute, a memoir of sorts. You know, this is one of our, one of those memoir episodes. Um, I hope that your, your family enjoys tuning in and listening to this because it, you, you've, you've talked so eloquently and so passionately about what Tanimer and Ansel means and how it's just got such a rich heritage of two great families coming together. Um, and really in the name of solutions and you've been finding solutions ever since together. So, um, but yeah, we've, we've talked, your products are pretty much everywhere, most major grocers, but, um, you know, folks can certainly visit the website to learn more. Uh, we have a ton of stuff on the produce Um, but you know, Brian, anything you want to tell folks about where they can go to find your products or, um, anything else? Yeah, I would say just check any major retailer or box store in your area. I mean, we don't sell to everybody, but uh, hopefully somebody in your area has our product and, and we'd be appreciative of any uh, Tanner and Anil branded products you pick up and hope mm -hmm. you enjoy them. So you guys can visit taproduce.com and there will be some amazing, there's some amazing photos and maybe even some video content too that you can view these gorgeous farms and uh, this beautiful area in, in Monterey County and down in Yuma where their operations are at. And, you know, Brian, I'm so thankful that you came on and, you know, we have this tradition, you get the final words and the last goodbye. So I'm going to throw the mic back to you to close out the show, but I'm glad that you were able to be on. Um, hello to Amanda and your children. And I can't wait to see you in Tennessee and hopefully in a, in a Baja racer down in Yuma again soon. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Like I said, you're welcome to come to Tennessee and see the hydro plant anytime. That might be a pretty cool episode or get some video down there. I think it's, it's so totally different from what we do in Salinas and you might, you probably get a kick out of seeing that, but um, outside of that, yeah, I would just, I thank you for having me on and the opportunity to tell our story and, and give some recognition to the people behind me that make all this work. You know, I mean, it's, it's not me. It's not the Annal family. It's not the Tanamura family. It's truly a group effort between the two families and, you know, the 7,000 employees that work here. So hopefully anytime you pick up one of our products, you, you think about all the hard work that went on behind the scenes to get that into the store and, and how much we appreciate you picking it up. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Produce Moms podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a featured guest, just send an email to Lori at theproducemoms.com. We know there is a Produce Mom in you because there's a Produce Mom in all of us. Join our community on Facebook and all social platforms. Help us change the way America eats. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.